This podcast is produced by Gallico Studios, a multimedia effort supported by a community of activists who share the goal of exposing the pollution story behind fluoridation. To join the studio or learn more, visit our website at www.fpollution.com. That's the letter F, then pollution, all one word, dot com. Welcome to the F Pollution Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Gallico, author of The Hidden Cause of Acne, How Toxic Water is Affecting Your Health and What You Can Do About It. And F is for Fluoride, a feasible fairy tale for free thinkers 15 and up. In previous episodes, we talked about the pollution scandal that started artificial water fluoridation in the 1940s and 1950s. Then we heard from several former senior government scientists who helped expose the scientific fraud at the Environmental Protection Agency and the Centers for Disease Control that keeps the practice of fluoridation in place. In today's episode, we'll discuss another organization that plays a critical role in propagating the myth that fluoridation is a safe and effective way to prevent cavities, the dental lobby. My guest is Dr. David Kennedy, a third-generation dentist with over 30 years of experience in clinical practice before he retired in the year 2000 to work full-time toward improving the dental profession and public understanding of oral health. Dr. Kennedy is a past president of the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology and has lectured internationally to the dental profession on the safety of dental materials in the human body. He is also the executive producer of the feature-length documentary, Fluoride Gate, An American Tragedy. Dr. Kennedy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. You've been working in dentistry in one form or another for about 50 years, if I did the math right there. And you come from a long line of dentists. Your father was a dentist and your grandfather before him as well. I imagine you were introduced to fluoride at a pretty young age. Can we just start with you explaining your earliest recollection of fluoride and what you thought of it growing up? You know, I didn't think anything of it growing up. Uh, Dad always came home with these uh, little tubes of uh, toothpaste that uh, um, they shipped out by the ton to all of the dentists in the world. And, uh, you know, we never had a family-sized tube of toothpaste. We had 87 bazillion little ones. And, and uh, you, know, it, it's, you know, it was recommended. You know, that was the, uh, the, the story that my dad heard, and, uh, um, but not my granddad. Uh, granddad uh, um, was not a big fan of fluoride. Um, he did, actually was graduated from dental school in 1898, and, and uh, his, uh, his skills were in removing teeth. So he was, he was more of a, an extractionist. But, uh, and that was dentistry in 1898 and uh, probably uh, saved a lot of lives because uh, shortly thereafter, the, the dental profession started putting mercury in people's teeth, which is another program. But uh, it's also insane. Did your family drink fluoridated water or give you fluoride supplements as a child? No supplements, but yes. So Lawrence, Kansas, uh, my hometown, was fluoridated in 1954, um, which was, uh, and my dad was on the city council at the time. He told me uh, about that. Uh, the um, United States Public Health Service, uh, Uniform Service, it's a branch of the military, um, came and uh, gave a presentation to the city council and they uh, told them straight out that they were uh, not doing their job of being good stewards of the community if they didn't uh, uh, immediately uh, start adding um, fluoride to the public water supplies because it had been proven, now watch this, safe and effective. So the mantra of fluoridation is safe and effective. And that mantra is actually the mandate of the Food and Drug Administration is to determine that any drug, substance, used to treat a disease of man or animal is a drug regulated by the FDA and that they must regulate it uh, both as safe and uh, effective. And that's uh, what the Public Health Service came and told the city councils all over the United States, including here in San Diego, where I live now, uh, in, in San Diego, it was 1952. San Francisco, it was 51. Um, this is uh, just six years after World War II. And uh, they mantraed the city councils with safe and effective, safe and effective. It's known to the government as safe and effective, safe and effective. And you will still hear today when you go to a city council meeting uh, the mantra and that it is not true. 
Fast forwarding to dental school, what did you learn about fluoride there and how does that compare to what dental students are taught about fluoride today? Well, I've often said that uh, dental schools are indoctrination, not education. The, we are uh, poorly trained in the sciences and that it's taught more or less like carpentry uh, to make the hold this shape and, and make that kind of angle and uh, do this kind of uh, um, preparation, etc. So it's taught as a, uh, much like a, you would teach somebody to do skilled carpentry to build a chair or a, uh, I'm really good at gluing stuff together, and that was one of the things you learned in dental school was how to how to prepare the surfaces and and get things ready to uh, adhese and and bond and uh, taking impressions and all that stuff. And it had nothing to do with science. That the science that they teach in dental school is rudimentary. And uh, the, I have a degree in biochemistry, and that uh, when I went to dental school, that some of the stuff they were trying to teach or actually did lecture on and we had to answer uh, truthfully the questions, it was incorrect. Um, the, the biochemistry guy had the, the Krebs cycle uh, uh, wrong. Um, we had um, physiology was wrong. And so how can such a low level of education be uh, rampant throughout the uh, dental school industry? And the answer is very simply is, is it's a curriculum that's approved by a trade association. And so you would not, you'd have bridges that fell down if the curriculums were approved by, you know, the Farmers Association or something. You know, that it doesn't make any sense to have science controlled by a trade association because they have what's known today as a conflict of interest. In your book, How to Save Your Teeth, you describe an article that you read in the New York Times in 1979 about a three-year-old boy from Brooklyn named William Kennerly who died from fluoride toxicity after he received a fluoride treatment at the dentist. I actually mentioned this same news article in my book, The Hidden Cause of Acne, when I talk about the lack of safety testing for fluoride gels and all the comments from moms on sites like Mothering.com where they're talking about their children becoming physically ill in the car on the way home from the dentist. You cite this article about the death of William Kennerly as the impetus for what made you start questioning the safety of fluoride. How did this article affect you, and what was its impact on how you practice dentistry? Well, I'm, I, I've been accused of being what's called a zero-tolerance kind of guy um, when it comes to toxic substances, and that when something is poisonous, uh, I don't think it belongs inside your mouth. It probably doesn't belong inside an office. And uh, so by, um, in a, it was an evolution. I used to think fluoridation was good. I, I, when I'm in the 70s, in this, it, I supported fluoridation. I was uh, practicing in the Navy. I, I was uh, shipped to San Diego, and the Navy base was fluoridated. San Diego was not. So I made an effort to drink San Diego was uh, Navy base water instead of the uh, San Diego city water. And that was because I thought fluoride was good. I was taught that fluoride was uh, good for you, good for your bones. What I didn't realize is that it probably had something to do with the uh, green stick fracture I had of my uh, uh, leg uh, running in track that uh, while I was in the Navy, that fluoride is damaging to bones. And uh, so it, it was an evolution. And what the Kennerly story shows you is that there's a lethal dose of fluoride in a topical treatment. And nobody had ever told us that. But at uh, the trial for William Kennerly, the uh, pathologist testified that there was enough fluoride in that child's stomach to kill three children. His, the hygienist that put it there and the dentist whose license she was working under, neither of those two people understood or even had an inkling, like I, had, that fluoride was a deadly poison. That's why it works. It kills stuff. It's found as a pesticide, especially in grapes and wines. It's used widely throughout the industry. If you've got termites in your house, they'll blow it full of sulfuryl fluoride. It's a, a deadly poison. So why would you allow somebody to put that in your child's mouth? I, I once wrote up a, an informed consent, uh, a truthful informed consent. You know, you know informed consent is, is a standard that every doctor has to give their patient before they administer care. You're supposed to tell the, the individual receiving the care the risks 
and the benefits of the care. And and think about this. Uh, uh, mom, you know, your child is now four years old, and it's time for us to start slopping deadly poison around their mouth. We know that it's uh, uh, not been approved by the FDA to be swallowed. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a vacuum in uh, to suck up any material that might be around there. And, uh, you know, we'll uh, keep a close eye on them. And if they do swallow, we'll call 911. Because dentists are only allowed to poison their patients. If the patient becomes poisoned, we must call a physician. Because we're not allowed to treat poisoning of our patients. And that uh, we think it's going to reduce their tooth decay, which is a non-lethal disease. But, you know, if we uh, don't pay attention, the child may die. Here, sign here, please. When you changed your mind about fluoridation, were you a member of the American Dental Association at that time? Yes, I've, I've been a member of the ADA since uh, I was a student in dental school. I'm, I remained a member of the ADA. I worked diligently to try to change their mind. I was on the board of directors of the Dental Society. I served my profession the best way I knew how. I tried to educate my fellow members of the profession. I'm still working on it. Uh, That's why I joined the uh, International Academy of Oral Medicine Toxicology. They use science to make recommendations, and uh, they don't accept funds from um, industry. And so they are not uh, conflicted, uh, whereas the trade association uh, um, accepts money in order to get a, like a toothpaste approved. You have to pay the ADA money, and it must contain fluoride. So they have a axe to grind. They they're making money off of it, and that is the one of the key reasons behind fluoridation is money. Um, what do they say? Uh, follow the money. It's a, a big business. Uh, every industry that does anything with the heat and smelting, uh, fertilizers, pesticides, all spread fluoride all around. So they know that the best way to detoxify fluoride is in the minds of the people exposed to it rather than the material itself. Because you're not going to change fluoride. Fluoride's a deadly poison. So you can't make that go away. But we can use public relations to make it appear as though it's not a problem. Has the ADA, to your knowledge, ever done a member survey or inquired to see what percentage of their dentists oppose fluoridation or have concerns about its safety? Not that I've seen. Uh, They haven't asked me, and I've written to them on many occasions, and that uh, uh, you can Google the ADA's opinion right now, and they've got a um, uh, brochure uh, uh, on the online and also they'll sell it to you. Uh, you can hand it to your patients. And there are factual errors in that brochure that are uh, legion. Uh, one uh, lady here in San Diego went through uh, from a scientific point of view, and I believe there were like 160 errors and just factual errors. And that that can't be by accident. You know, you might make a mistake here, but you would just as likely make a mistake in the other direction. Nope. All the mistakes are in um, lying about the uh, benefits of ingested fluoride. There is no benefit to swallowing fluoride. So if there's no benefit to swallowing fluoride, why are we putting it in the water? And the one one pundit said, the, oh, oh, the water splashes on the teeth and it makes the germs there, uh, uh, inhibits their growth. Well, I don't want water that inhibits the the bacterial life because there are more bacteria in our body than there are cells, and they're important for our survival. They make our vitamins. They help us digest stuff. You know, that's just an insane statement. It's not true, but uh, it's still insane to to think that you want water that's so toxic that if you splash it on your teeth. But, you know, it does. If you splash it on your um, tropical plants, it makes them sick. If you get it on their leaves and stuff like that, they're not used to having uh, fluoride out of the sky. It it doesn't rain fluoride unless you're next to a a smeltery, uh, like uh, the the people that died in Donora, Pennsylvania, where the uh, zinc factories were belching fluoride into the sky. So, you know, they just make stuff up, and and, and then they run with it. The American Dental Association is the biggest advocate of artificial water fluoridation in the private sector. But before we get into that, let's just start with the basics. What is the basic mission of the American Dental Association? I think their basic mission uh, is something like uh, service to the public, uh, 
and the public health. Their actual mission is to generate large amounts of money for themselves, in my opinion. That's why do I feel that? Is it that I was on the board of directors of the Dental Society back in um, the 70s, and that uh, at the meeting, um, Rick Schmidt told Dottie Graves to turn the recorder off. What do you know when you're in a meeting? When uh, the president tells the lady to turn the recorder off, you're, they're about to engage in something that's unlawful. And that's exactly what he did. He wanted all the members of the board of directors to uh, foster uh, lawsuits against uh, a clinic here in San Diego that's called the Union Dental Clinic uh, so that they could drive them out of business. Well, that's not the function of a professional organization. And I stood up and told him that. I said, this is not the proper function of a, of a professional organization. We're supposed to be promoting oral health, not protecting Rick Schmidt's practice from some other dentist. And um, they can, proceeded to follow up with uh, Rick Schmidt's idea on how to drive dentists out of business, and I resigned. Uh, that is not why I am in dentistry. I'm not here to feather my own nest. I was here to help people get well and stay that way. And that's unfortunately what the... ADA and their their minions. The uh, the dental uh, uh, dental health uh, is uh, promoted by the public health service, and they don't. That they have never ever done anything to promote oral health. What they do is promote fluoridation. That they see as their mission. So, what are the main activities of the ADA, and how are they funded? ADA is funded. Uh, one from the members uh, that uh, about 10, 20%, I believe, is the uh, income that comes from their membership, uh, annual dues. They own insurance companies. Um, the Delta Dental, for example, was started by the ADA. There's also the TDI, which is the dentist insurance company. It's a malpractice insurance company. So they're making money from insurance, disability insurance. They insist the uh, companies pay them to attend their meetings and have booths at their annual meetings, and they won't let uh, companies come and display non-fluoridated toothpaste, um, at least they wouldn't when I was uh, uh, talking to them, because they said, oh, that we don't recommend that, so we won't have them there. So they basically filter the information that they allow the members to hear. So uh, same with the mercury is it, I've offered on many occasions uh, to uh, review the current uh, research on mercury and they have utterly refused. And that is how they control the marketplace. They don't let um, dentists who are, you know, a, all dentists are mercury poisoned and B, they won't, don't know the science because they were poorly uh, indoctrinated actually, instead of educated. And the, they are continuing to be deceived by their trade association who are making money hand over fist. So where's the rest of their money come from? It comes from industry. And in a lawsuit in California years ago, 94, that the ADA uh, asked and was dismissed from a lawsuit uh, over mercury, they said they owe no duty of care to the public. They're a trade association and they represent the dental industry and dentists. So yeah, they're saying they have a dual role. They say they represent industry. Well, what's industry? Well, that would be people like Procter & Gamble and 3M and all those people that make felling materials and fluoride toothpaste. And, and so the ADA sees themselves as their representative. And why? Because that's where most of their money comes from. Even though the American Dental Association is a dental organization, they also vouch for the safety of fluoridation on all other aspects of human health. Here's a section from their official statement on fluoridation currently displayed on their website. It reads, quote, Since the inception of water fluoridation, the American Dental Association has carefully monitored scientific research regarding safety and efficacy. Based on that review, the association has continually reaffirmed water fluoridation as the most effective public health measure for the prevention of dental caries, end quote. Since the ADA is composed primarily of dentists, how do they monitor the scientific research on the safety of fluoride, especially the research that involves fluoride's effect on parts of the body other than teeth? Well, A, they're not entitled to, because as a dentist, you're only entitled to uh, treat structures of the head and neck. 
Um, so if we damage a thyroid, we're not entitled to diagnose the damage nor treat it. So it's disingenuous for them to, on one hand, say this, and at the other hand, say, well, we've reviewed. And what it is is called, it's called a biased review. This is how they've detoxified the scientific literature. When you go to the scientific literature, every single study that has done a good job of looking at the variables, rats in a cage are much more accurate at looking how any element causes changes than epidemiology. Epidemiology is where, uh, like Grand Rapids, you were mentioning that. That's not a study. That was a, an experiment on the human population that terminated in five years. And why did they terminate it? The data shows that because the people in Grand Rapids developed a dental fluorosis at a much higher rate, especially the African-American community, than did the, the people in the non-fluoridated area. Actually, people in non fluoridated area didn't have any dental fluorosis. So now it's up to more than 50% of the kids have at least one tooth damage. So they're basically saying this is how they detoxify it in the minds of their members. What they say is, well, our scientists have carefully reviewed all the scientists, and there's really nothing to all this evidence of neurological impairment. There's nothing to this about thyroid harm. There's nothing to this about bone fractures. There's nothing to this about cardiovascular disease. But if you go to the National Academy of Science 2006 review, you will find that there is something to bone pathology, joint damage, um, thyroid damage, and neurological impairment. Uh, Bob Isaacson uh, wrote the chapter on neurological impairment, and his experiment years ago showed if you put one part per million pure sodium fluoride in the drinking water of a rat, that the, in 52 weeks, the rats had lesions in their brain, arteries, and kidneys. And remember, these were adult rats. We don't have any studies showing that baby rats can be exposed to fluoride. We have studies showing that humans, and this is uh, two studies, uh, big studies, epidemiological studies showing that humans, if their mother is exposed during pregnancy, you have a neurologically impaired, that means for the listeners, brain damage, that the child is not normal. And that's because of fluoride crossing the placental barrier. What they said was it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. It doesn't cross the placental barrier. It took another 50 years to prove that that is false. We can measure the amount of fluoride in the fetus. And yes, it did cross the placental barrier. And actually, it crosses it rather easily. So they just make stuff up. And then they stand, we stand firmly behind it. Okay, well, you know, support it with some science. They can. Does the ADA sponsor any original research on the safety of fluoride, or have they ever partnered with any other organizations for safety studies, such as the National Kidney Foundation or the Arthritis Foundation, groups like that? The ADA doesn't do research. What they do is review papers that are used to... Um, damage other researchers, and they also use their power at the National Institute of Dental Research, now known as the uh, National Institute of Cranial Facial Research, to damage researchers. Uh, Phyllis Mullinex at Harvard did a nice, very carefully controlled experiment showing that if she exposed rats to fluoride at uh, levels that are not uh, outside the norm for uh, uh, exposing rats to fluoride, that she had a permanently neurologically impaired rat if it was uh, before uh, birth, if it was after birth, you could reverse it somewhat. So what do they say? They got her fired. She sued and won over unlawful termination. She was recruited to come to Harvard to study mercury and fluoride. She never got to study mercury, but she got to study fluoride. And when she did, and she studied on her own dime and her own time. And what she showed was it was harmful to the brain of the rat. And their solution was to get rid of her. No. <laughs> the solution is to get rid of fluoride. But if you're, uh, you know, it's called double down. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're caught with your hand in the cookie jar, oh, that's not my hand. The American Dental Association devotes a portion of their website to a section they call Advocating for the Public, and the primary program featured in that section is fluoridation. Within that, there's a feed called Fluoridation in the News. I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes because it makes it really clear that the ADA shares news about fluoridation like 
like it's their baby and they're the proud parents and they want to show off all the great things that their child is doing and how great it is, as opposed to being objective medical researchers who are vigilantly monitoring all the latest scientific information about how fluoride is affecting the public. If you look through the feed, you'll see a lot of news items with headlines like, Article highlights importance of fluorides and 17 communities receive grants to support water fluoridation, but you won't see a single news item about, for example, this study published a few months ago in the Journal of Pediatric Medicine by Dr. David Bellinger, a pediatric neurologist at Harvard University, about how dietary fluoride contributes to the overall toxic burden affecting the neurodevelopment of children. If the ADA makes a health claim about the safety of fluoridation, for example, its effects on children's neurodevelopment, are they accountable in any way for the accuracy of those claims, either from a legal liability standpoint or otherwise? In 1994, they claimed that they owe no duty of care to the public. Uh, I think some of the um, attorneys might disagree, but the judge in uh, San Francisco, at least in 94, agreed that they owe no duty of care, which means that they can say up is uh, down and, uh, and it's our opinion. And you don't have any uh, way to refute. What they said is we're not a government agency. We do not regulate dentistry. And that, that would be a job of the Food and Drug Administration to regulate the products that dentists use. Okay, let's go look and see what the FDA says about fluoride. It's an unapproved drug. Okay, what does that mean? That means you can't sell it, you can't ship it, you can't market it, you can't advertise it, and they're breaking all those rules. The ADA has been a tireless advocate of artificial water fluoridation since the federal government first endorsed the practice in 1950. Here's their statement of endorsement currently displayed on their website. It reads, quote, The American Dental Association unreservedly endorses the fluoridation of community water supplies as safe, effective, and necessary in preventing tooth decay. This support has been the association's position since policy was first adopted in 1950. Since there is no national mandate for fluoridation, can you explain to our listeners how the ADA influences a city or a state's decision to add fluoride to their public water supply? I think a lot of people would be surprised to learn about how much influence the ADA has in American politics. In a recent article in the Washington Post entitled The Unexpected Political Power of Dentists, the author, Mary Jordan, describes the ADA as, quote, a political force so unified, so relentless, and so thoroughly woven into American communities that its clout rivals that of the gun lobby. Can you explain how the dental lobby works to physically implement fluoridation at the local level? They do it in a, um, um, as the as your thing you read a minute ago, it said endorsement, that we have policy by endorsement. And that is a silly, silly way for societies to make decisions. Uh, of course, uh, Monsanto is going to endorse Roundup. You know, it's, you know, they're not an unbiased uh, source. But what happens when the issue comes up before a city council anywhere, the, the call goes out through the local dental society, is it is your um, moral duty to show up at the uh, meeting and uh, promote fluoridation. I was in uh, uh, Texarkana, t- uh, Texas, and that. Uh, the dentist showed up and, and, and one dentist uh, said, there is, I've never seen a case of dental fluorosis. Well, A, he's in a non-Florida community, and B, even in non-Florida communities, there's about one out of 10, one out of 15 uh, children have a, a visible dental fluorosis. So either he's blind or he's lying or he doesn't know what it looks like. And the, it might be all three. So, and he was standing there in a smock that had visible smuts on it. The OSHA won't let you leave a dental office with a dirty gown. You have to take those clothing off and put it in the washer in the office. You can't transport it. You've got to wash it there. And here's this guy telling, in his great opinion, sitting there with his dirty, dirty white coat on. (laughs) Anyway, it was, uh, it was shocking. As an intelligence analyst, I've spent a lot of time thinking about these sort of mental traps that the human brain tends to fall into when we're trying to analyze information. I can see how it would be tempting for practicing dentists to draw conclusions about how their patient's teeth are being affected by fluoridation, even though they're not doing any actual research. 
For example, I was at a city council meeting in Melbourne, Florida recently, where the city councilors were trying to decide if they should stop adding fluoride to their water supply. And just like you described, the state and regional branches of the American Dental Association prompted local dentists to show up and defend fluoridation. Many of them said things like, When I worked in a non-fluoridated town, I saw firsthand people coming into my office with mouths full of cavities because they didn't drink fluoridated water. And I'm not saying those types of anecdotal observations should be disregarded, but dentists do have a high risk of bias when it comes to fluoridation, not just because of how deeply the safe and effective mantra has been ingrained in their profession, really from the beginning of government-led dentistry, but also because of how much it would hurt public confidence in modern dentistry if it becomes widely known that they've been wrong about the safety of fluoride for all these years. I read your account describing a similar instance to my experience in Melbourne at a meeting in Chula Vista, I think it was. Do you recall the story I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about, the San Diego City Council, San Diego fluoridated, voted to fluoridate the, the city water in, in 1952. Citizens didn't think that was a good idea. The, the court said, well, you got two choices. You can either drink the stuff or you can pass your own law. So we passed our own law. And then the lobbyists went to Sacramento and uh, in the 97, they passed a mandatory fluoridation bill. And then city council was reviewing that. And the ADA did their usual thing of calling up all of the dentists and saying, you've got to come in and tell them how good it is. And uh, the, the old, old gentleman from Chula Vista came in and, and uh, was saying, you know, I've been practicing for 50 years and boy, this fluoridation in the water has done a tremendous job in reducing tooth decay. It's just absolutely wonderful. I mean, the t- amount of tooth decay has diminished tremendously since I began my practice back in the 30s and blah, blah, blah. And I saw him in the hall, and I said, you know, Chula Vista is not fluoridated. He said, it's not? He didn't know. And, you know, most of the people don't know. And, and you know, but he, there has been a tremendous drop in tooth decay. Tooth decay went up in the Depression. What did we have in 1929? We had an economic collapse similar to the uh, 2008 collapse, only worse, because nobody did anything to stop it from falling apart. And people were abject poverty, starvation, out of work, migrating all around this country, trying to find something to do to feed their family. And they didn't have enough to eat and that they had malnutrition. At that same meeting with the guy from Chula Vista was another lady. And she said, I've raised six children. None of them have ever had even one cavity. And I live in San Diego and they've never been exposed to fluoridated water. I taught them to brush their teeth. And I used only the food from our garden and our farm, organic. And we ate good food. And that's what prevents tooth decay. If you told that story with as much vigor and enthusiasm as the um, government has been um, blah, blah, blahing about how fluoride is good for you, we'd have a lot healthier people. The truth is that tooth decay is a disease of negligence and, and malnutrition where people don't get adequate food, you know, uh, like, like Wheaties uh, and um, uh, cereals, uh, all, anything uh, in the way of a processed food has lots of fluoride in it. There's no shortage of fluoride in it. But if you eat sugary breakfast cereals, you'll have more tooth decay. That's just very simple. So th- the other aspect of this is the sugar industry promotes fluoridation so that you don't think you need to not eat sugar. Because the real problem is, is bad food. You've got white flour, white sugar, white death. And so that's the, uh, uh, the bottom line is that they don't want to interfere with your uh, profits from selling sugar. What about the ADA's influence in Washington? Just last year, they spent over $2.6 million to purchase a property steps away from the Senate side of Capitol Hill, even though they already own property on the other side of the building. They're now one of only two lobbying groups, the other being the Heritage Foundation, that owns physical property on both the House and the Senate side of the U.S. Capitol. How much of an influence do lobbyists from the American Dental Association have on our representatives in Congress? Lots. Uh, Scott Peters even cited the uh, um, ADA's uh, information that they had uh, lobbied him to put fluoride in the water supply here in San Diego when he was a congressman. 
they're one of the biggest lobbying agencies in this country. They spend more money on lobbying than any other single source. I was told. I don't. I don't dig through the uh, the archives of their lobbyists, but uh, if somebody uh, uh, wants to can. But anyway, they they show up at every meeting, and that they have lobbyists. Uh, you can letter. I think is the name of the lobbyist that met with every member of our city council. I can't get a meeting with them as they don't want to hear the other side. Uh, I gave my poison baby talk. You can watch it online. Um, that there, it's irrefutable that the amount of fluoride in a baby bottle, if made with fluoridated tap water will harm that infant. It will cause dental fluorosis. Dental fluorosis is linked to brain damage, lower IQ, bone pathology later in life. I gave my poison baby talk and then, the, the lobbyists were in there from the uh, uh, all the dentists, and they also had Scripps, Salk, and uh, the uh, Radies Children's Hospital, uh, and, uh, as uh, Scott referred to it as an army of doctors. And uh, so he asked the question. He said, well, what is this about the baby? Uh, and I volunteered the answer. He said, no, no, I've heard from you. I want to hear from this army of doctors. And what they did is they pushed up the million-dollar lobbyist, Howard Pollack, Mr. Pollack. He's not a doctor. And uh, they pushed Mr. Pollock up to the podium to answer that question. And Mr. Pollock does a tap dance and, and a, a soft shoe and, and says, oh, babies drink a lot of water and blah, 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 blah. And you get all done. He says, you should make the formula up with distilled water. <laughs> and, then, and then Scott Peters voted to put fluoride in our water. But he admitted that I was correct, that the amount of fluoride in the baby bottle uh, will contain enough fluoride at the alleged beneficial concentration in water. And here's the deal, is that all drugs are administered by uh, weight for weight. Is it milligrams per kilogram? When you go to the doctor, they always weigh you because that makes a difference in what prescription they're going to write, how much of this drug you're going to take. Fluoride violates every single tenet of how you prescribe a drug because they put a concentration in water. Well, what if you work outside? What if, what if you go for a run? What if you're a marathoner? What if you're a farm worker? What, what if you're a baby and you drink all of your weight in water every three days? Well, that makes putting any chemical in the water supply impossible to dose the baby. And many European com- countries have, have acknowledged that. Uh, 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 Avid Carson, a, a Nobel uh, laureate, said uh, it violates every known principle of medicine. So how can we get to do it? We have lobbyists promoting it, and then we endorse it. And so we don't, we should not make policies by endorsement, but that's exactly what we've done. In a recent episode, we heard from Daniel Stockin about the CDC's role in the pollution story behind fluoridation. As you know, he's done a series of Freedom of Information Act requests that reveal the close relationship between the CDC's oral health division and the dental lobby, including the American Dental Association. For example, one of those requests revealed that when Ambassador Andrew Young released a statement opposing fluoridation and calling for fluoride gate hearings, Judy Sherman, the Director of Congressional Affairs for the ADA, sent an email to CDC officials, including the Director of the Oral Health Division, Bill Bailey, asking for a list of studies the ADA could use to refute claims of fluoride's neurotoxicity. Another lobbyist, Bill Moss, who used to be the director of CDC's Oral Health Division but has since moved on to a lobbying job, jumped into the conversation and asked if there was an expert in another division at CDC they could call on to refute those claims verbally. He even writes, and I will quote him here, Of course, our biases may be entirely different than other divisions. They may be looking for the slightest evidence that something in the environment is bad for brains, whereas we are only interested in compelling evidence that our favorite substance causes brain changes. How does the dental lobby and their clear bias in favor of the safety of long-term fluoride exposure influence the CDC's policy on fluoridation? That's all the, Dan Stockton did a good job of spelling out the fact that there are 35 people at the CDC who see as their only job is to promote fluoridation. It's the dental division. Ask them what else they've promoted. Nothing. So we have $100 million a year being spent on lobbyists and 
CDC, and public health and dental directors throughout every state has a dental director who is a member of the military. It's part. It's called the U.S. Public Health Service. It's a part of the uniformed military service. And if you work for the public health service and you're not um, following orders, that you get kicked out of the public health service, court-martialed, because you're not following orders. It's not uh, an open-to-discussion kind of group. It's follow the orders. The general said, you will do this, and if you don't, you don't get to work for that agency. That's how they control the message. Uh, they, they also use the dental boards. And this is, a, if you want to know, uh, quite frankly, I think that there is a, a lawsuit that they could do. is called RICO. Because the ADA, if you look at the emails back and forth that Dan has dug out, and uh, also some of them through the uh, dental boards, they use the licensure of states to uh, go after dentist licenses who don't aren't playing the, the game and they're not part of the party. And so RICO is where you have um, somebody with a vested interest, like, for instance, the American Dental Association that makes uh, hundreds of millions of dollars from their endorsement of a fluoridated toothpaste and, and fluoride-containing products used in the dental office. Using their uh, lobbyists to uh, use a government agency to control their critics. And that is, uh, by definition, RICO. And that, um, but that's what they do. And they think that they're uh, entitled to do that. Uh, they argued in the, in the Tolhurst case that uh, they're entitled to do whatever they want to do because they owe no duty of care to the public. I think they do owe a duty of care to their fellow Americans to tell the truth. They don't. Does the ADA have any financial interest in promoting fluoridation? Obviously, their official position is because they believe fluoridation is a safe and effective way to prevent cavities, but I'm wondering if there is any kind of financial incentive. For example, there's a video on my YouTube channel of Dr. Hardy Lineback explaining how dentists profit from correcting dental fluorosis, a discoloring and modeling of tooth enamel that develops when children consume too much fluoride in their diet during the time period when their teeth are forming. It's become a very common condition in artificially fluoridated countries. Do you think this kind of financial gain has anything to do with why the ADA has a blind spot when it comes to evaluating the safety and effectiveness of fluoridation? Well, the, first off, that the ADA is not entitled to determine the safety and effectiveness of anything because they're not a regulatory body. I kind of agree with what they said in the, in the Tolhurst case is that, is that they're not regulators. They're liars. And so they are promoting industry, and that's what they're doing on behalf of industry. Lobbyists can lie. They're entitled to. And so they're saying we are uh, able to do that because we owe no duty of care to the public. So if they were entitled to determine safety and effectiveness, then they would be a branch of the government. They would be a government regulator. They're not. And so uh, they make money and that they pay back by defending a very, very poisonous substance that's used in dental products. But it also, they, they get money from the sugar industry. Uh, there was a recent thing on the CDC. The dental division gets lots of money from the sugar industry. Um, they're basically helping industry continue with the terrible food we have in this country. And, you know, our, our longevity is declining in the United States. You know, the, they, oh, well, you know, we're living longer now. Yeah, uh, compare us to some other countries like some of the European countries where they don't use Roundup in the food and they don't put fluoride in the water supply. We're, we stand alone in the world with only English-speaking countries like New Zealand, Australia, Ireland, Southern, Southern Ireland, not Northern Ireland, and uh, the United States and uh, about 10% of England. So how come all those countries that speak English um, are doing this and, and uh, it's none of, no fluoridation in Germany and uh, Sweden, uh, Denmark, uh, how come those guys? Well, when you a foreigner comes in and doesn't speak the language and they're lying to you, you have a tendency be, to put a little more scrutiny on the stuff that they're saying. And each one of those countries in Europe ha ha has examined it and come up with their own reason not to do it. Uh, I think Denmark was a royal decree. We don't have a king yet. Um, and so, but... Each country came up with their own decision. Uh, Finland had a, 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 an experiment uh, that went on for um, uh, 40 years in Kupio, Finland, and, until the uh, uh, high rate of bone cancer was found in one city 
in Finland. <laughs> that was in Kupio, Finland. And that there was a study from New Jersey showing that the, the bone cancers in New Jersey were primarily in fluoridated communities. And then a, a, a thorough review of uh, young boys exposed to uh, uh, fluoride uh, in the uh, at two points, they, they develop bone cancers at six and uh, at 12 to 14. You served multiple terms as president of the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, a professional dental organization that is opposed to fluoridation. IOMT is in many ways a counterpoint to the American Dental Association. Can you tell us how the academy came about and what actions it takes to help end fluoridation? Uh, we are not lobbyists. Uh, we're basically a science-based organization um, to help the, the medical and dental profession um, sort out toxicology. Toxicology is the study of how uh, various uh, elements and uh, conditions impact the physiological health of uh, animals and humans. And that uh, we were formed in 1984 uh, to bring science into dentistry and uh, evidence-based dentistry. And that from about that time on, the ADA began to talk about evidence-based dentistry. But evidence-based dentistry means you can cite a relevant piece of research to support your point of view. They can't. They say it's recommended. So if you look at what the, the endorsements are what they talk about, they want to tell you what the, the Tourist and Convention Bureau says about fluoridation. I'm sorry. I don't think that's a scientific organization. And where did they publish their research? It doesn't exist. So... They have learned the rhetoric about evidence based, but they don't know what that is. Or if they do, they pretend to not understand. They don't have any. That's why they will not debate. I, I was in uh, uh, Hart, uh, uh, I was in Kansas at uh, um, a little town uh, in the in the middle of Kansas that they wanted. They had, had all set it up with the, the army of dentists that were going to come tell us how good fluoride was and. Uh, my dad lived in Kansas, so I, you know, I said, yeah, sure, I'll stop by and we'll, we'll have a nice debate. When they heard I was coming, they said they weren't going to come. They can't debate. What are you going to say about the baby? What dose of fluoride do you think is safe for the baby? And show me the evidence that that's true. What study do you have showing that a baby consuming so many milligrams per kilogram of fluoride was not harmed? They don't like that kind of question because most dentists are so poorly trained, they cannot calculate dose. And how, dose is always weight for weight. So when you say to the dentist, what dose of fluoride do you recommend? They'll give you a concentration in water. I'm sorry. A concentration in water is not dose. You have to know the weight of the baby and how much of that water the baby drinks in order to calculate the dose. And so they can't even do the math to calculate dose. And if they can't do the math to calculate dose, you should not trust their opinion. And what activities does IAOMT participate in to um, help end fluoridation and raise awareness of fluoride's um, health concerns? We have uh, seminars that we put on twice a year and that uh, um, on multiple different topics. Uh, it's not related just to, uh, we tried to uh, lots of different things. We started out uh, measuring the amount of mercury that came off fillings. Uh, in animals. Uh, it's not, uh, we started with, with humans and then our ethics committee said no. Uh, no more human experiments does mercury is a deadly poison. So we switched to uh, animal studies and uh, the amount of mercury coming off fillings is enormous. And that we, we looked at fluoride, the amount of uh, fluoride that we find in bones and uh, with the National Academy of Science review, we had further support and uh, the, our review of fluoride is impeccable. It has never been criticized on a scientific point of view. They just disagree. They say it disagrees with our endorsement. I'm sorry. I'm sorry your endorsement is wrong. If you got support for your endorsement, you should go get it. But it's not in the scientific literature. We did a complete literature search. They do these biased literature searches where they eliminate things like the Basson study, for example, or that you mentioned, or, or Jennifer Luke's study showing that the uh, uh, calcified pineal gland, etc. They basically find some way to fudge the review so that that information is not in their review. Or if they do, they say it was, they, they bad mouth it. They say it was poorly done or is badly flawed. Well, uh, you, you mentioned the Grand Rapids study. Uh, in, in several 
different lawsuits, different courts have determined that the advocates for fluoridation do little in the way of science except denigrate the opposing point of view. And so that's not how science works. And dentists don't understand that. Criticizing somebody else's work is one thing. You know, you may not agree with it. And if you criticize it, and if you're a scientist, then every scientific paper that's published has what's called a materials and methods. And that means that it tells you exactly how you did the experiment. I got 12-day-old rats, and I gave them one part per million fluoride in their drinking water for 52 weeks, and then we did this and this and this. Well, you can get 12-day-old rats, put one part per million fluoride in their drinking water, and see what happens. No, no, you say, oh, he's a bad person. (laughs) No, it's not about the scientist. It's about the results of the experiment. And that's, ask him, ask him what level of fluoride you find in the bones of the people of Grand Rapids today versus uh, where they were in the, in the 1940s. It, it's, it's gone up enormously, and that's coming from water fluoridation. You do not want fluoride in your bones. There were two IAOMT dentists at the city council meeting in Melbourne, Florida, that I mentioned earlier when the city councilors were voting on whether or not they should continue fluoridation. Both of them spoke very persuasively about the chronic health effects. It just wasn't enough to counterbalance all the other dentists who vouched for fluoride safety. It took a lot of moral courage for them to stand up in that room full of their peers in the community where they live and work and try to persuade the city councilors to stop adding fluoride to the water. After talking with Hardy Lineback for episode one about the effects his opposition to fluoridation had on his career, It's easy to see why dentists might be hesitant to come forward when they have concerns about the long-term health effects of fluoride. Can you explain the potential risks individual dentists are taking when they oppose fluoridation? Yeah, they might get their license revoked. And this is why I say that if that happens, go get get RICO. Go get a RICO attorney. Because what happens is you can share with the city council your opinion about fluoride. If it disagrees with the ADA's position, then what they do is they find some way to attack you. Uh, like Rick Schmidt was doing years ago, suggested that if they, if, you know, I stood up and said, I don't think this is good. And they saw a patient of mine, they'll look in that patient's mouth and say, Oh, you should sue that guy. That terrible work, whether it is or not. Oh, that's terrible work. They foster lawsuits. So they use the legal system. Or they file a complaint with the dental board and saying, oh, that guy's a terrible dentist. And then so that throws you into a a situation where you have to defend your livelihood. Dr. Kennedy, thank you so much for being on the show and for being such an outspoken advocate, even in your so-called retirement, of ending this dangerous practice. Is there anything else you would like to add before we sign off? Just now, I want to say that this is my opinion. And that uh, I'm entitled to my opinions. And if you disagree, I have the, uh, the scientific review by the, Ameri- uh, the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology that is complete with all the scientific references for everything I said. You can review it, read the actual studies yourself. I have. And if you disagree, you should. My guest, Dr. David Kennedy, is a third-generation dentist with over 30 years of clinical practice. He's also a past president of the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology and the executive producer of the feature-length documentary Fluoride Gate, an American Tragedy. The film can be viewed online at fluoridegate.org. If you enjoyed this episode of the F Pollution Podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. It really helps other listeners find the show. The F Pollution Podcast is a Linda Peterson production. This episode was executive produced by Scott Kuslin, Linda Palmasano, and Christy Lavelle. To find out how you can help us expose the pollution story behind fluoridation by joining the crew at Gallico Studios for as little as $1 a month, or to sign our petition to end fluoridation, visit our website at www.fpollution.com. That's the letter F, then pollution, all one word, dot com. Thanks for listening. The information presented in this episode reflects the views and opinions of the hosts and guests invited to appear on the show. It is not intended as medical advice and does not represent the views of the FBI, the U.S. government, or any other individuals or organizations.